Welcome to Reversing Course, Learning Loss in a Global Pandemic. My name is Fernando Hernandez, and I'm the Executive Director of the Ivy Street School. We're a nonprofit organization reimagining therapeutic and educational services, supports, and programming for neurodiverse students and their families. And we do that through our best-in-class high school, our post-secondary transition and vocational program, two unique residential programs, and our Skills for Life program, which offers training to students families and school districts in skill development and planning for the transition into adulthood. But I want to start by saying thank you to Dr. David Chard and the entire BU team for making space for us today. And I want to name how excited I am to hold this conversation, how truly grateful I am to our three incredible panelists who I'll introduce momentarily. There's a lot of noise right now in the world of education, and that is nothing new. But it might be fair to say that school and learning has become more politicized than ever. The conversation about the impact of learning taking shape this last year was at times reduced and at other times overpromised. But the real noise to me is much more simple. Parents and educators know something has happened to their children's education these past few school years. It wasn't business as usual. And at the core, we're, we're afraid that the kids aren't all right. Adults are worried, worried about the unknowns and the impacts of all the unforeseen changes to traditional learning. And kids are picking up what we're putting down. And many are confronting the same fears. What did I miss? What didn't I get? And rightly so. We've heard students, particularly the most vulnerable students, poor, black, brown, multilingual learners, non-native English speakers, as well as kids with disabilities, we've heard that many of those students have experienced learning loss that could exceed two academic school years. We've heard about the mental health crisis that is currently present and looming. We've heard about the rise in chronic absenteeism and the impact that that will have on content and skill acquisition. We've heard about students lacking access to technology and students without supervision at home to support learning. And of course, we've heard the reality that so many families were required to place new demands on their child, like working outside of the home or supporting the child care of siblings or other family members. We've also heard about the victories the narrowing of the digital divide, school systems finally ready to meet the demands of the 21st century with their devices and toes. You know, teachers and educators experiencing the sort of most blunt, profound professional learning as they pivoted to remote instruction. I've heard about students accessing clinical services at increased rates, improvements in teacher feedback to students, and more advisement, more one-on-one -on -one conferencing and individualized student check-ins. Wherever you land, maybe it's somewhere in the middle, with any alarm that keeps ringing, there is the inevitable push and a universal demand for solutions. There is a real pressure to use this crisis to seize the opportunity it has offered us in reimagining and redefining key pieces of education. And I could talk about all our wonderings for hours, but that's not why you're here. You're here for a conversation, one that's rooted in solutions with our brilliant and esteemed panelists. So first, I am excited to introduce Jonah Edelman, Jonah is the co-founder and CEO of Stanford Children. Stanford Children helps kids at the bottom of the economic ladder rise up through effective dropout prevention strategies, expanded career technical education, and improved college preparation and post-secondary guidance. They are committed to increasing access to quality early childhood education, improving literacy instruction interventions, increasing funded, funding equity, and improving school quality in communities with a concentration of chronically low performing schools. Beyond the advocacy efforts, Stanford Children drives impact through three national programs, Teach Kindness, the Center for Anti-Racist Education, and the Center for High School Success. A parent, an organizer, and an advocate for racial and economic justice, it's a pleasure to introduce Jonah Adelman to our panel. And I'm also excited to introduce Lindsay Jones. Lindsay Jones is the president and CEO of the National Center for Learning Disabilities, a nonprofit organization that promotes innovation, research, and advocacy to improve the lives of the one in five with learning disabilities and attention issues. Lindsay was named president and CEO of NCLD in 2018 after serving over five years as the vice president, chief policy, and advocacy officer. In her previous role, she designed and implemented NCLD's federal and state legislative strategy. She also developed advocacy campaigns and worked closely with NCLD's grassroots network of, com of committed parents. Lindsay began her career as an attorney, advising and representing schools and parents in special education matters. She was a partner with the law firm of Gus Rosenfeld in Phoenix, Arizona, and is admitted to the U.S. Supreme Court and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, as well as the State Bar of Arizona. 
Lindsay is a sought-after education and disability policy expert. She sits on the National Advisory Committee of the Science of Learning and Development Alliance and is the advisor to the Progress Center, a program that improves outcomes for students with disabilities. A leader in the fight for equity and access for young people living with disabilities, it's an honor to introduce Lindsay Jones tonight. And of course, last but not least, we have with us Heather Pesky. Heather serves as the Senior Associate Commissioner for Instructional Support at the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. In her work leading the Center for Instruction Support, Dr. Pesky manages the department's work in educator effectiveness, curriculum and instruction, and support for English language learners. Dr. Pesky combines her experience as a teacher, policymaker, and researcher to lead her team to ensure Massachusetts nearly 1 million students have access to rigorous standards, rich and meaningful instructional materials, and effective educators. Dr. Pesky has spent her career advocating for students of color and low-income students to have meaningful experiences in schools with excellent teachers. So it's a good panel. We're gonna have a great conversation tonight. But to start us off, I think I wanna take a step back. And I wanna ask all of our panelists, I'm gonna start with Heather, but I wanna ask all of our panelists, what is learning loss? Why are we here tonight and what are we talking about? Heather? So when I talk about learning loss at the Center for Instructional Support, I'm of course talking first about a loss of academic skills and knowledge, but I'm also talking about, and it's critically important to talk about the loss of connection to schools that students have experienced this year. The loss of relationships to adults who they know and who know them, the loss of friends, the loss of being around other students, and the loss of a sense of belonging in a community that supports them and wants them to grow. So we know from the data that learning loss has been stronger in math, especially at the elementary level, though certainly we're worried about reading as well. And Jonah and I have long worked on early literacy and I'm happy to talk more about that. But also from a state perspective, we don't have a great understanding of the problem of unfinished teaching and learning from a state perspective. So individual teachers and schools have knowledge of their students and where they are and what they know or don't yet know, but we have a striking lack of data at the state level on how students are doing in terms of academic learning. So I can talk a little bit more about the importance of assessments. I'm sure that question will come up and we can address it. I would also say in terms of the current state of the problem that we have focused on closets full of Clorox and HVAC systems over academics for nearly 14 months. And that in many respects is, was the right thing to do because we had to make sure that students got back to school safely and that we had protocols in place and that we knew what to do and we knew the distance and we knew about masking and we had plans for how you have snack in an elementary school, which as it turns out is like a huge problem and challenge. And yet in being so focused on the logistics of responding to COVID, and the pandemic, we've really neglected thinking about, talking about, learning about, and implementing those mechanisms for unfinished teaching and learning. So that's where I'm excited to pursue the discussion tonight. Um, and I also would come at this with a lot of humility. So Brandon, you said that we're here with all these solutions. I don't know about most of you, but this year I have felt like it, I'm too little, too late, it's mm. not enough, and I do not know what to do. So given that state, I, you know, I, I, I don't know what to do. And so what it means is that we've had to rely on and turn to each other to come up with these solutions. And I think particularly given the racial reckoning that we are rightfully experiencing in this country right now, we've also needed to step back and engage stakeholders we've never engaged before at the policy table. And we've needed to invite them and we've needed to listen to them and we need to continue to do that moving forward, particularly as we address this challenge of unfinished teaching and learning. And finally, I would just add, there's good reason for optimism. Students learned things this year, it's just that they didn't learn them in ways that we're accustomed to. And so how do we learn from students and families themselves about what worked, what didn't work, and what we can replicate moving forward so that we can use that phrase to build back better? I guess I'm handing back to you, Brandon. Thank you. That was great. And, and thank you. Thank you, Heather, for that. And, and the optimism there, I think, is, is almost a place where we should just center ourselves, right? In, in 
also allowing ourselves to sort of experience the joy of being creative in this moment as well. I'm gonna ask the same question to you, Lindsay. You know, what is learning loss? What are we actually talking about? Yeah, thank you so much again for um, having me and for all the great work everyone is doing. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. It's also an honor to be among so many educators. I completely, Heather, your comments about what are we doing? What is going on, right? I completely uh, agree with that. And I wanna say thank you to the educators who stepped up in so many ways and worked so hard this year in dealing with a, a, a really, really challenging situation. As a parent of a public school student, I wanna thank you. And also just from my position at NCLD. I, I agree with almost that, with everything that Heather said. I wanna add two different um, unique things to that from my perspective. And the first, when I think about learning loss right now, after having just been through a big uh, policy discussion about funding, I think funding, massive federal funding coming to our schools and states, the American uh, Rescue Plan Act, it's got $125 billion in federal aid with about $30 billion specifically must be spent for instructional loss mitigation. Mm -hmm. We use a lot of terms, unfinished learning, um, instructional loss, I think learning loss. Um, what, I, what I feel like we need to really focus now on, now that that money is headed out the door, is how fast it's gonna hit districts, how many vendors are gonna hit districts with using products with labels that talk about recovery. We see this a lot in special education. Um, one of the biggest concerns we have is the pressure that will be put on local schools and districts to spend that money quickly and not to have the time they need to spend it wisely. We've got a lot of history of that. So we've got some recommendations for how they can make things we hope they look to, to provide our students with disabilities um, with great access to those programs. We certainly don't wanna waste students' time in tutoring programs that aren't providing evidence-based instruction for our students or science-based reading. Um, so the first thing is I'm very focused on um, trying to get my organization and others to provide good information about how to use those funds to get the best um, services to those who are the most in need. Second, uh, this is to the optimism, but first, um, I think it also goes a little bit to, it's the term itself, learning loss. Um, as you've said, this is a bigger moment we must meet. Learning loss as a term definitely focuses too much on the student and not the system. And as much as I don't like that term, it also is interesting to think about because it implies you were learning quite a bit before and that the system was working and all that happened was sort of your removal from the system, the disruption. Um, and so you were making learning gains that you lost. And in our case, in terms of looking at students with disabilities and particularly those with color, of color, I disagree with that premise in many ways because the evidence is challenging, right, prior to the pandemic. And over the last 20 years, our data shows the same trend. More than 96% of eighth graders with learning disabilities scored below proficient on math and reading in NAEP. That's pre-COVID. That's a learning loss. To me, that's not the kid, that's the system. Kids with learning disabilities, three times more likely to drop out of high school, two times as likely to be jobless as an adult, 50% more likely to be involved in the criminal justice system. And we know that if our students are black and brown, those numbers are far more stark. Um, and that's pre-COVID. Everything that's happened since COVID has exacerbated that. And all of the evidence about it is telling us that. I just wanna make clear that nothing about having a disability causes those outcomes. The system causes them. Nothing about being black, Latinx, any ethnicity, any language, causes those outcomes. The system and the design of the system is causing them. So I think we can agree that though, when I think about learning loss, I keep thinking about, can you lose something you didn't actually have access to? But what an incredible moment if we seize it. We have billions of dollars. We have educators who have been unleashed in many cases to try and be creative and do new things. We can see some of these issues. I think we have a really incredible moment um, if we seize it to really put in place some of the strategies that we've been wanting to use for a long time to address what I would say is a historic 
risk of persistent inequality of learning loss. I look forward to that. Thank you so, so much, Lindsay. And you stayed with Heather, right? Like there is optimism here and there is opportunity here, but your commitment to, for both of you, to framing the, the sort of current reality. And, you know, we're not just arriving at a broken system, we're arriving at a system that has been broken and we're sort of experiencing all of that in real time and just more focus. Jonah, you're up next, you know, same question for you. What is learning loss? What are we talking about here? What is this moment about? I'm gonna pick up where Lindsay did, um, which, um, but first, you know, thank you to David Chard, who's just such a wonderful person and leader. Um, just so, you know, grateful for his friendship and his um, work over decades. Um, and Brandon, it's been wonderful to meet you. Lindsay and um, Heather, an honor to be with you. Um, have actually worked with Lindsay a bit professionally and Heather um, on, on parallel, um, have been an admirer, so thank you. And then to everyone um, who's here at the end of a long day, um, you know, and, and to all the educators, as, as my um, co-panelist said, thank you for everything you are doing, you have done, and for those of you who are, you know, doing the impossible um, this year, you know, and doing your very, very best. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I'm going to skirt the question because I um, agree with Heather's framing um, more so, and I know you do as well, Brandon. Um, the, um, I think the interesting thing to look at really, which could provide value um, to folks who are spending their time is really what is it that educators, um, education administrators um, can take away, can learn in order to um, do better, be better. Um, no one wants to go back to normal. I don't think anyone here would say the goal is to go back to normal. Normal was, um, you know, a lot of folks, you know, on this webinar and, and a lot of colleagues working really, really hard, but in systems that weren't actually designed to help everyone succeed. You know, where built inequality was built in, baked in, absolutely, um, in, in, in many cases exacerbated by the way the systems operated. And so I think the question, you know, that we've been, it's been animating me and my colleagues at Stanford Children um, and the educators were really um, privileged to work with is um, how can, um, we take away, uh, you know, lessons from the pandemic um, because there's some really been a few, you know, some powerful lessons. And then, and then, you know, human beings, we're really habit oriented. You know, there's a lot of inertia for us as humans. I'll just speak for myself. You know, I like to do things the way I've done them. And when, you know, somebody asks me to change, particularly my wife, it's not that pretty oftentimes. Um, and then you think about, so we just had this big break and, and, and the opportunity is to actually get perspective and not do things the same way. So I would view that as a huge opportunity. Think about it in the 10 year time frame. If you know, there were a wholesale significant adjustment of practices coming out of this pandemic, and now we're all fixated on learning loss and how far behind, which really isn't anything new. Um, but then 10 years from now, things started to work different. For example, let's say that there's this recognition of relationships being so fundamentally important. Well, you know, newsflash, relationships are important. Well, you know, any educator would say that, but it's not necessarily the case the way schools are set up so that, you know, especially in secondary, that relationships can get fostered, that kids can be known, you know, that, that there's really some adult really paying close attention, that you feel lifted up as a kid, right? You can't fall through the cracks. Well, what if, you know, coming out of this, school district said, you know what? We get it, we see it because of how many kids just literally dropped off the radar completely. And we need to change the way we do um, ninth grade and then you know, ideally 10th and 11th and 12th grade and um, make sure that there's an adult paying attention to uh, every kid, that there's advisory, but there's actual advisors um, that you know, teachers are meeting every and staff are meeting every couple of weeks and talking about kids and looking at trends. You know, Early warning intervention systems are not a new thing, right? But why aren't they the absolute positive, like just the norm? That's the way we do it. In elementary school, why is home visiting the exception and not the norm? It's the norm in Head Start because someone decided back in 65, you know, I'm certainly proud of my mom's involvement in that, in that program's, you know, founding and growth, but somebody decided early on that that's just part of the performance standards. So anyway, I'm just giving a couple of examples. We'll get to others, but 
um, that's that's where my head's at. That's what I'm, you know, what have a lot of energy around as opposed to looking at, you know, the negatives and the barriers. I appreciate that, Jonah. And yes, we we are on the, the same page <laughs> in many ways that we have as we have come to discover. But I there is something sort of unifying this group, and that is we have all spent our careers sort of fighting against what is normal and trying to fix systems that we saw, we can see so clearly are broken. Um, and there's new eyeballs on that. And I, you know, I would continue to argue, and I've had this conversation with folks privately, you know, there's a new group of families who feel like their child is now experiencing the sort of brokenness of the system. And so there's more attention to it because poor black, brown, families, families with kids living with disabilities, they've been experiencing a system that wasn't working for them. Um, and now we have new families at the table. And so that's sort of part of this reckoning. I, I'm going to say it again, I'm so thankful that you guys are here and we're going to dive into some, some questions. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit. We have phoned a few friends. We told them you guys were coming <laughs> and we said, do you got a question? And so the first one, we're gonna hear from a few of, of, of those friends tonight. And then we're gonna take some questions from our audience and I'm watching these sort of roll in and some really meaty, great things to talk about tonight. So the first question is actually for Heather. Uh, it's coming from Christine Biate, the, the chief academic officer of the Sac Sacramento Unified School District. Hello, I'm Christine Vieta, and I serve as the Chief Academic Officer in Sacramento City Unified School District. And one of the many questions that we're pondering as we're preparing to open our schools for the fall is in considering the unprecedented public health and educational emergency that we have all managed this year, how do we prepare our schools in the fall? What are the key drivers that our systems must consider to ensure that we're designing our schools with equity at the very center? Small question, Heather. <laughs> but, you know, as, as you are thinking about your own work right now, sort of what is, what are some of these essential questions um, that folks should be operating with? I think you need to think of three things. So I appreciate the question from uh, CAO Biata. Uh, first of all, I think you need to think about how do you ensure that students feel like they belong? This is from kindergarten to high school. Jonah and Lindsay both spoke about this, but how do we um, tap into students themselves and their families so that we create environments where they want to come to school and feel like they belong there? Some kids haven't been in school buildings in over 14 months. So they already feel isolated and separated. So first, designing for equity means ensuring that they come to places where they feel like they belong. I talked to a student who serves on the state, uh, the state board in Maryland, and I said, what would you want to keep from the pandemic? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, in our county, in Montgomery County, we, did, um, we had advisory every day. We used to have that like once a week, maybe once a month, but during COVID and the pandemic, we had advisory every day. I feel like I got to connect with an adult who cared about me in a small community. And I was looking at Jonah's high leverage practices. That's not difficult to structure into the school day, a short time period where students connect to adults and they also connect to a small community of students and they feel like they belong. So that's the first thing. The second is something we have always known is critically important. And that is, who are you assigning the students to? Mm. Teachers are hugely important in the impact on students, both in terms of academic outcomes, as well as in terms of social emotional learning. What we have done for decades is we have assigned the students with the most needs to the teachers who are least experienced, least knowledgeable, and least well supported. We have got to upend that pattern and now is the best time to start to do that. So as you think about heading into the fall, be very, very specific about which students you're assigning to which teachers. In Massachusetts, we have a tool we call the Student Learning Experience Report where we literally track 
which kids have been assigned to which teachers and the characteristics of those teachers over the years. And this goes across districts. Right. So if this past year, your student was assigned to an inexperienced brand new teacher, make sure that kid does not have an inexperienced brand new teacher next year. And I know there's a staffing shortage and we can talk about that, but that's the second thing is make sure that you're thinking about your staffing. And within that, make sure you're supporting your teachers. They're exhausted. I was reading an article in the New York Times about, um, about how various corporations are, um, are trying to provide incentives to keep their workforce in place. And I had to say like, what are we doing in education? Not very much. So think about what you can do to support your teachers and your principals, especially as we head into the fall. And then third, make sure that your academic program has a vision and is coherent and also is, is on grade level and standards aligned. And that begins with the curriculum that you're using in your school. So don't leave it up to teachers to have to spend 100 hours designing curriculum when we know that there exists high quality curriculum out there along with aligned professional development. And we have a whole initiative in Massachusetts we call Curate that helps to review and rate curriculum materials. Don't leave it up to teachers to have to create everything themselves when we already have good things available that will help them to accelerate student learning. So those three things, sense of belonging for kids, being critically um, critical about who you assign which students to, and then third, think about your curriculum and the comprehensiveness of that curriculum and make sure that it's good. Wonderful. I'm gonna just bring in Jonah to this moment too, because I know the, the sort of frame that Heather offered around this sense of belonging, it is deeply tied to how you have been advocating for, for student success and student access. Is there any, anything more you wanna sort of bring there? I couldn't agree more with what Heather said. And, um, you know, trying to be super concrete, I'm thinking about our audience members and, you know, um, I'm, you know I think we're all wanting to send signals and not a lot of noise um, here. Um, we didn't coordinate beforehand, by the way, so there wasn't there's no master plan. Um, but um, so in the in this the the vein that Heather's talking about, um, specifically, if you look at Phoenix Union High School District, and I know some of you are secondary, some of you're not, but just on the secondary level, um, they did an advising for all um, during the pandemic. The first version of it was super intense, which was every adult every day, you know, connected with a group of students. They've toggled that back a little bit, but. I really think it, you know, you think about it, and this is not a new idea in education. I've talked to folks who are, you know, career educators who said, yeah, and it used to be in my school, everyone got assigned, including the janitor to a kid, you know, to kids. Um, do that, you know? Um, I mean, it'll vary in terms of the, how you do it, how you do the assigning, um, whether it's more advisory, like Heather said, whether it's uh, more informal and there's just a, you know, need to check in um, periodically, whether it's both, um, how much training you have, doesn't need to be perfect, but that's something you can do in at middle and high school level is just ensure that every kid is connected to an adult. And then the th second thing I just say from an enabling point of view to what um, Heather said um, is look at your schedule. It may be too late for next year, but it may not be. And those of you who switch to a four by four uh, or you know more block scheduling, I mean, think about the teenage brain and the adolescent brain and just this is one to step back on. It's like, well, why is it, does it make sense to have a kid have to keep, a 14 year old or 15 year old have to keep track of eight courses, mm. you know, seven courses? Like my kids can't keep track of anything. I mean, they're 15. Um, and then, so think about then who benefits, uh, who, who can do better than that? The, the kids with the parents who are super active um, in kids' education and they're able to be on top of the kid, right? Well, why don't we just think about be student-centered and think about the, you know, adolescent brain and have, you know, four courses a quarter and then, by the way, those burnt out teachers have half the number of papers to grade, you know, or 60% or of the, the number of papers to grade and tests to, to grade. So just things like that. Um, I mean, not things like that. Scheduling in particular and then assigning would be two concrete things I would suggest that I think are really actionable and they aren't. Um, and, and you do have a cost when you're switching. I get it from, um, you, know, um, you know, block scheduling with, uh, you know, three terms. Um, or, you know, and even semesters to quarters, but now you've got the federal money. So wouldn't that be a good use of federal money as a bridge as opposed to paying some vendor 
you know, for a couple of years who may or may not be aligned with what you're trying to do. Um, I'll stop there. We could, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to get back on my track, but I want to talk more about the use of time in a, in a school day. And we're going to, we're going to do that a little bit more later. And I want to hear from, from everyone about that. But the next question I'm going to, I'm going to offer to, to Lindsay. Um, and this one's from Carrie Young. She's an education reporter here in Boston for NPR. Let's hear from her. Hi, my name is Carrie Young and I'm an education reporter with WBUR in Boston. One of my questions has to do with assessing learning loss among students with disabilities. As uh, schools get back underway with more in-person learning and also for next year, when it comes to reassessing those IEP plans, um, how are schools going to be prioritizing when that happens? There's going to be a lot of need and probably not enough resources to do it all all at once. So. What type of guidance are schools getting to prioritize which cases first? And um, will there be any extra resources to help schools out in that effort? And Lindsay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna expand on this question. <laughs> so it's, and I'm gonna make sure you're unmuted too. Just make sure you hit it. But the, okay. you know, this is about sort of who comes first in the hierarchy of need right now, particularly in, in the disability community. And then at the same time, I'm thinking a lot about school systems who have just not been able to offer the sort of related services, right? Things, speech or counseling or some of the other stuff and things that so many of our kids get as part of their school day that's outside of the classroom. Um, and how are we making up time? Can we make up time? You know, like directionally, what are you guys advising? Sure. So first of all, resources wise, there's $3 billion coming in additional IDEA funds. Um, and that's an important thing to remember. Also, all of the funds under ARPA for instructional loss and others can certainly be, um, they should be spent among all students in terms of um, how the schools are making decisions with resources and what programs they're providing. It is a challenging question to say, which order do we attack these problems in? Um, and I understand school districts being incredibly challenged by that right now. Uh, many places that we've heard of that are doing some really in unique and innovative things. I wanna talk about just about related services, what you just mentioned. We've actually seen some of our biggest success stories in one-to-one -one services over Zoom. Um, which is pretty incredible because it was the opposite, maybe just to me, but I thought, oh no, this will be a, a, a very challenging way to provide it. In fact, many, many of our students have, the teachers have stepped up in incredible ways and those very specialized service providers. These are some of our best success stories. Teaching um, multi, uh, all different types of reading instruction, one-on-one, -on -one, small group, um, OT, PT, dropping things off at, in the beginning of the pandemic at people's homes. I mean, manipulatives and other types of things. And really developing some incredibly strong connections. Um, I think one of the things we see with Zoom is, interestingly, like if we were all at Boston University tonight, we, the three of us, or the four of us would be on a stage quite far from the audience. We might not be able to see them. Now you can be looking over my shoulder. What books are there? Who is this person? You know, in some ways, it's a much more personal um, environment, which for many of our kids with disabilities is very helpful for all of our kids. It goes really to what Heather and Jonah just mentioned about belonging. To your point about um, how do we catch I guess catch them up or kind of your last point. <laughs> what about that? I think we have to take seriously, Jonah just did a, a great job mentioning the, the, how do we streamline the schedule in ways we know can make a big difference. What we've been looking at and pushing a lot at the um, National Center for Learning Disabilities are promising approaches to accelerating learning. And that number one, that has to do with streamlining curriculum focusing on grade level standards, but thinking through power standards, shrinking, what do they actually, what are the prerequisite skills we actually need to teach? And I think in lieu of remediation, my biggest fear 
is that people will begin to provide remediation, which we know doesn't work, has no evidence. But if they can provide effective acceleration programs where we can streamline the content, reduce the redundancies in curriculum in, in order to focus on rigorous grade level content, but familiarizing students with those prerequisite skills at really critical junctures. And that's, that's a big lift, I get it. It's a, it's a big change, but I think right now, um, just as Heather was mentioning, school districts and states and the, and the federal government, those who provide TA and guidance, could be helping provide the curriculum that does like achieve the core and other groups have looked at um, streamlining these standards. And we've seen some of our school districts, Milwaukee Public Schools um, has a redistrict opening plan that's very focused on doing this and provides professional development to teachers. Um, and that's for all kids going through this. We know right now there are some real emerging practice that demonstrates for kids with disabilities who are grade levels behind and then basically drop out because they're not engaged and they can't, they don't see a path to catch up. This is a very promising way forward. Thank you for that. I think, I, I just wanna also hold on to some of what you said tonight because I'm, I'm still holding on to the optimism, right? That so many of our students were accessing services that they oftentimes avoided because of the nature of being able to do it virtually. And it also, for so many, as we know, that happens particularly in our larger, actually large and small school districts, right? A lot of those providers who are offering those related services are moving around schools. And you've sort of allowed for a, a higher concentration of that one-on-one -on -one experience because you've shifted the use of time. And I think the use of time is sort of this, this magical thing that has happened in this moment to, from, Jonah's point to thinking about how we schedule kids during the day to also how we've allowed adults to adapt differently to, to how they're, they're using their own time day in and day out. Um, I'm gonna keep us moving because there's so much here. Um, the next question is for Jonah and it's from Dr. Michelle Durham. She's an award-winning child psychiatrist here at, uh, in Boston at Boston Children's Hospital and full disclosure, she is one of our board members and a wonderful person. So we're gonna hear from her. She has a question for you. Hi, I'm Michelle Durham. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist at Boston Medical Center. And so what I hear and what I know is that we're trying to figure out now, all of these kids are gonna eventually go back to school and, and families have continued to work, but there's been a lot of loss. Um, and not just loss in that they can't hang out with their friends during this time or go to school, but there's also loss in the fact that we know that black and brown people were the most affected by the pandemic, that were from low income communities. Um, and so there's a lot of death. And so I want schools and our communities and our policymakers to really think critically about how do we set up that school system and the teachers there to basically provide a space for kids that are going to be dealing with a lot and we want them to learn and thrive. Um, but teachers, staff, and the students will have been traumatized by this pandemic in many, many ways. Um, and they have to deal with grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins who were lost during this time. On top of what we all know about racism and discrimination and their fam the impact that's had on their families. And so I think we need to think very broadly and critically at a policy level. Um, and I invite your thoughts on how do we do that to set up our school systems, not only in those that are the most and well-resourced but also in those that have been historically low resourced and provide them the ability to have a counselor, to have groups, to have therapy, to have all their, their needs met um, so that they can thrive um, and learn at school when so much has happened for them in this past year. Yeah, uh, I think what a great point. And then what Dr. Durham said at the end of her question, um, I think, is the answer. Um, so educators who are viewing, well, let's say administrators who have some budgetary authority um, or folks who you know, might be able to advocate, you know, I feel like 
um, I would ask the question around what percentage of the funds that are coming in are going to be used for social and emotional support um, for kids. I mean, I think, you know, for whatever reason, the mainstream of our society, um, I mean, if, you know, whatever you want to call it, like the default is around high dosage tutoring. I mean, there's, there's some efficacy. The challenge around that obviously is that the, the practices and the caliber of the delivery that leads to the gains that get people excited is extremely hard to replicate at scale. Um, so I'm not saying don't do it, you know, but if you compare that to the value of having another counselor, um, you know, um, having partnerships with behavioral health systems where kids can get more, um, you know, access to clinical care, um, can you have another social worker who can meet kids um, still, you know, pretty, um, in many cases, pressing urgent primary needs, what's a better use of money? I would just put that, you know, to you all and um, not saying that in certain areas, it's easy to find the supply, but that would be, if I were running a system, I would, you know, at least try to delegate um, somebody to be spending time on, on that top, those topics and try to find as much in the way of, um, you know, mental health resources and, um, you know, sort of social work and casework support. I would also try to get, um, you know, additional um, adults in my buildings um, in secondary um, schools who look like the kids and they may not have, you know, letters behind their name, but if they love kids and they're able to be, you know, mentors or coaches um, and just, you know, be, be folks who are those um, advisors, um, you know, consider that um, as an opportunity to provide some additional adult um, relational capital, some support for kids, um, you know, someone who looks like you, who has made it and who's able to really listen and they can also identify um, with the things that you're, you've gone through. Thank you for that, Jonah. Heather, Lindsay, anything you want to add here? I'm going to then keep us moving. And, and thank you. I, the, it keeps going back and I'm, I'm using your language, right? Just the, and I'm using Heather's language. It's about making sure our kids feel like they belong and they're gonna be able to access all of the stuff and things that happen in whatever this reimagined school is. Um, but it, it centers on belonging. And part of that is, is about adults shaping that experience, knowing our kids, adults who look like our kids. Um, the next question for us is, is from Leah Hamilton. She's director of education at the Barr Foundation. And this one I'm gonna, you know, we're thinking about, you know, a major player in, in resourcing schools right now. So I'm going to offer this one to Heather, um, which is a good question for us. Hi, I'm Leah Hamilton. I'm the Director of Education at the Barr Foundation. And at Barr, we focus a lot on high schools and how we can help high schools really prepare students to thrive in life after school. And during this extraordinary time, we thought it was very important to ask students how they were doing and what they were experiencing. And what we learned through that survey of over a thousand um, students in high school across the state of Massachusetts is that they were reporting, they felt academically behind, they felt disengaged from peers, from teachers and from their schoolwork. And importantly, they felt like they were not prepared for their, their next steps after high school. And so I have what I know is a very challenging question, but it's an important one. Um, what is the purpose of high school? How can we transform schools so that when we're asking students five years from now, 10 years from now, they're reporting, feeling engaged, feeling known, feeling challenged, and feeling prepared to thrive? And very importantly, how can we leverage the lessons of this year about what worked for them and what didn't? and also this new influx of resources to propel a new vision for high school forward. Thank you so much. I love Leah. And that was like 12 questions bundled into one. It was a rich one. So you choose, <laughs> choose your own adventure. It was rich, but such a, such a beautiful question for us to be thinking about right now. And I should have a disclaimer that the Bar Foundation funds some of the work of my team, particularly around principals. So we're grateful to them. 
And I found their survey uh, of a thousand students in Massachusetts very helpful. They did this a number of months ago. It was some of the first large set of data that we had from students and student voices. And I would also wanna give a shout out to our journalists here in the Boston area who've done a really good job of chronicling the stories of families and the Barr Foundation has funded some of that good work. So I'm not avoiding the question, but um, I wanted to just appreciate that. I mean, I think Leah's answer, uh, Leah's answer lies within her own question. And so she said there at the end, what is the purpose of high school? Um, I mean, I think the purpose of high school is to enable students to choose where they wanna go after high school and, and to not have that choice be dictated by their zip code or their race or the language that they speak but rather that all of those characteristics of students should be viewed as assets to them in making the choice after high school. So we want to ensure that high schools are providing uh, students the opportunity to feel like they belong, like they're part of a community. Uh, we, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't say that we need to prepare them academically with the skills and the knowledge to be able to go on to that next step, whether it's career, whether it's college, whether it's the military, there are a variety of options. Um, we need students to feel challenged and engaged. We need them to feel like they're doing meaningful, authentic work. I think many of us who are parents have had the classroom come into our dining rooms or in my tiny apartment into like all, all regions of our 800 square feet. Um, and in so doing, I think it's allowed families to say, you know, to what end? Why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that um, we sent our students back to school and we sent educators and principals back to school um, in conditions where we asked them to, to take some risk. Granted, we mitigated it by lots of our protocols, but nonetheless, if you're, if you're asking people to risk something as precious as their children, even a small risk, then you have to ensure that it's valuable and worth it. And so I would ask us about, particularly about high schools, are we making sure that that experience for kids in high school is valuable and worth it and gives them opportunities after high school to dictate their own choices? And we have a lot of different reforms I can talk about more specifically, but that's really the point, right? Like, is that four-year experience doing something to contribute to a joy of learning for kids and to giving them opportunities after high school that are, that are of their own making? Mm. I am going to keep us moving. We could, this, that, her question could be, it will be our next panel. <laughs> and we're just going to stay on that for a while. But and you should put Leah on the panel. <laughs> I mean, yeah, for sure, for sure. She'll join us next time. I'm excited about this next question because it's from, you know, one of the folks who have been on the front line. It's from a teacher, um, TK Nagayoshi, who is Massachusetts Teacher of the Year, also a BU alum. And if you haven't met him, you will love meeting him in just a few moments. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to bring this question over to Lindsay and then anyone else who wants to get in, you should get in as well. My name is Sekeru Nagayoshi. I also go by TK. I'm an English and research teacher at New Bedford High School and the 2020 Massachusetts Teacher of the Year. Now, on some days, I find myself bummed out by the quality dip in teaching and learning that's happening this year. But on a lot of other days, I'm actually at awe at how much my students are learning both in and outside of the classrooms, about themselves, the world around them, and on the kind of impact that they want to make. And with all this talk around academic learning loss, I think we often fail to recognize the broader and perhaps more important life skills, mindsets that our students are developing in spite of, and in some cases, definitely because of this challenge. So my question is about this learning gain. What essential skills and knowledge do you think our students are learning this year? And what can schools do to build on this learning? Wow, that's a great question. Uh, and congratulations to the teacher of the year. Um, I think some of the most important things that are happening, the first I would absolutely say technology. This is, and I'd say this for our teachers and our, um, our young adults. At NCLD, we run a young adult program. Young adults to us are 18 to 26. 
And we also work with a lot of students who are currently in high school as they're preparing to move into that. And first of all, every computer, everything we're using has unbelievable accessibility tools built in. And even some of our students didn't know about these before this year. This may seem like a, not such a huge deal, but for people with disabilities, reading disabilities, math, everything, using these tools and learning and having some time to actually play with them and work with them is transformational and it will last with them as they prepare to work in many different types of environments. The second thing I'd say is that I think actually, you know, when you think about high school for kids with disabilities, one of the, and all kids, but one of the number one things we focus on is teaching self advocacy skills and awareness. This is critical because if you're a person who might have to request an accommodation or a particular type of device, you're going to have to do that to an employer under a totally different set of laws. You're going to have to know how to explain what you need, how to evaluate what you need, and then ask for it and have the confidence to do that. I actually do think in some ways this um, environment has had led to lots of good conversations where over Zoom, teachers are teaching students how to use these tools, tools they'll use as 21st century workers forever. What we saw in the beginning of the pandemic, March through June last year, many teachers immediately put PDFs online. They were doing a great job putting lots of resources online, but for kids with dyslexia or other reading disabilities, added reading in a PDF that isn't accessible can add hours and hours we saw actually our teachers and our students develop really great relationships to talk about those things and to find their way through them together. And I think the confidence, well, we won't capture that in data probably, right? But the confidence building that that gives to students, the ability to have had that conversation with a caring adult, carrying that into another conversation where they may not know the adult as well, but they need to be able to, to speak about it and where they themselves are the expert. A little bit on that, which is an important way to, to perceive yourself and to feel about yourself. We all need to feel like we're an expert in these things, and it can it can really um, encourage some great skills. So I've seen those. In addition to what I've talked about with the related services, I've seen some incredible stuff out of that. We're building some case studies right now about the teacher-student relationships and self-advocacy, in particular around technology. That's good, Lindsay. It's, you know, I mentioned this at the top of my remarks too, just the sort of one-on-one -on -one relationships and the space for that that has happened. For many students, it has not. But for so many, it had, we, school, and schools and teachers who have been able to figure that out have been able to go deeper in doing that sort of shoulder to shoulder work that's so necessary for every kid, but particularly uh, our most vulnerable kids and doing that sort of self advocacy work, learning to be your first advocate, your best advocate. Thank you for, for shining light on that. I am gonna keep us moving because someone is like stealing minutes from me and I don't like it and we have a lot to get through. The, the last question is from two parents. Um, Allison and Jim Carroll. There are two parents actually of a student here at Ivy Street School. And I'm gonna ask, um, I'm gonna ask Heather to respond to this one. Hello, we're Allison and Jim Carroll, and our son attends a therapeutic boarding school in Brookline. Our son is very social at school, and he loves going out into the community. He relies on a strict routine to maintain consistency in his daily life. When the pandemic hit, our son had returned home. He was supposed to come home for a few weeks, but he stayed for eight months. He was expected to participate in remote learning and attend all his therapies online. But those expectations were too much for him to handle, and he quickly regressed unable to participate in the program. Our question is, due to the pandemic and the resulting fractured progress over the last year, what can be done to compensate for lost or deficient therapeutic and educational services? Yes, that's first, I'm really glad that you had Mr. and Mrs. Carroll ask, asking a question because I, I've seen in the chat a little bit about um, where what is the role of parents 
I think we've learned so much about the critical role of engaging families this year. Um, even And we've actually been able to do it because of the technologies available in ways that we haven't been able to in the past. Um, we have a lot of guidance at the state around um, supporting students with disabilities during the pandemic, but then also just generally both requirements and ways in which we need to provide interventions and support students according to the law and according to the rights and according to their IEPs. So I can put that in the chat. Um, I would also ask, I think that's a very good question for Lindsay, given your expertise. So if you don't mind, I'm going to pass it to you because I feel like this is better for you to answer than me. Absolutely. Um, and so family engagement, we've got tons of research that shows it's critical, especially for all kids, but especially for families um, of kids with disabilities. I think everybody on here knows that. And so, um, and Massachusetts actually, you have some incredible stuff on family engagement and the stakeholder engagement. You're a leader in the nation in many ways uh, in that process. This question they're asking, the way I heard it is one of the, it's one of the meatiest questions we're facing in special education. And that is because parents have rights under the law, children have rights to education and to services, and we have a concept, a legal concept, that when those services are not provided as set forth in the legal documents, the IEP, the district might owe compensatory services. Um, everywhere around the nation, I think we're trying to figure out and sort out what might compensatory services look like where that actually is at issue and what is separate and is sort of a learning recovery service that all students are experiencing. Um, the Carols have did a great job describing the many different services their students get. It's going to be critical for families and schools to work together. I was an, a, an attorney for many years in Arizona. Phoenix Union High School was one of my clients Go Phoenix Union. Um, they, I worked so much with families and students. What I learned from that is I can't imagine it's going to be any different right now. We've got to work together to make sure that everybody um, is still in it and is in great communication about what's being provided, what has been provided. And so I would really encourage um, schools right now, especially to be incredibly proactive and over communicate with the parents of kids with disabilities to let them know what's happening. Because I think there is real confusion. We've seen some guidance from the Department of Ed, we're going to have to get more. Um, we've seen some cases filed. But this is just, a, it's a very gray area. The first place always to start is the relationship between the school and the family. I am so thankful for that, because I think it's a message that our, our school leaders and our teachers need to hear. It is also a message for families to hear that they can demand that sort of clarity. And I, it's why I thought it was important to share that question tonight, right? Like parents, particularly families of some of our most vulnerable kids are feeling this loss and they want to know, can I make up for lost time and how do I do it? And I think to your point, Lindsay, that sort of that really clear communication around a young person's journey and the sort of next steps that are happening as things start to sort of take different steps, uh, it's essential, it's essential. And parents at, you know, we talked about students being, learning their own sort of power and self-advocacy. It is empowering our families, reminding our families of their own power as well. Um, thank you for that. And we're, you know, all of us parents in this room grappling with similar questions, right, about what our kids need moving forward. I'm going to shift gears. Um, so I'm just sort of moving us. I want to thank all of our friends who phoned in for, for a question and thank you guys for taking them. But I want to ask, this one's for Jonah. I am sort of, you know, as we're staying in our space of optimism and we're thinking about sort of many of the opportunities that have come from this moment. One for me, this is also full transparency, I'm a firm believer that grading in schools is like far often more for adults than for kids. And is punitive and we just sort of like it like helps us get some of our work through our feelings that we're having about young people and uh, and school systems many of them are all coming off of the heels of sort of reimagining their grading systems 
we have the largest school system in the country who is has moved to sort of pass not even a pass fail right like an incomplete and so many schools are in this space do you think directionally we should be bringing back traditional grading um, and if not what is the sort of answer here that schools should be thinking about and school districts should be creating around um, I, I wouldn't put myself out as a grading expert, but I would say I think it's important to step back and try to and ask ask the question, what is the point um, of a grading system? And also, um, how can we um, be equitable um, as uh, a district or a system in how uh, grades are um, assigned? You know, there's massive variation. A kid's, you know, um, to the extent we heard Heather talk about very, very early on, by the way, around the, the, the assignment to teachers being um, sort of opposite. Um, and you know, so I think to the extent that grading systems align with what the educational goals are, it, it would seem to, you know, it's kind of a simple point, but it isn't the case oftentimes. So for example, you know, if, if I don't turn in homework, should I get a zero that then I, you know, can't change and then it takes my, um, grade down to a point where midway through the semester I'm demotivated and I just stop being interested in learning. That doesn't seem to be furthering the goal. Mm -hmm. um, in, in life, in work, you know, an orientation toward taking feedback and improving based on the feedback is pretty darn important in most jobs yeah. and in inter interpersonal relationships, I would say too. Um, and so if, if the grading system really reinforced that um, strength that we're trying to build um, in, in children and young people, that would seem to make sense in terms of one of the points of high school, which is to help you know, young people um, you know, successfully navigate adolescence and learn key um, you know, skills and, and strengths and habits that will serve them well. Um, so just putting those things out there. Um, I, I will put again in the chat um, you know, the, the recommendations around uh, competency-based credit recovery. If I, you know, for example, finish a course um, and I, and I you know, um, have not learned adequately or, or shown learning um, to the level that I should, should I get an F and then basically not be able to you know, do anything about that? Um, or should I have the opportunity to um, show proficiency or competency? Um, again, I think these are just important questions to ask. And if I am trying to improve, should I improve based on the things that I haven't shown mastery of, or should I have to repeat the entire course, you know, potentially with an online provider with not very good instruction at significant cost to the district? Um, that's almost a rhetorical question, but it, the way it works now, um, actually the default is, um, you know, not how it should be. So I think this is an opportunity where school districts can do things better coming back and ensure that there's fair grading, that it's consistent. Um, and then that when kids are uh, fall short, they have the opportunity to make up um, and, and do so in a way that actually teaches them the right lessons. Yeah. Heather, I'm going to, I want to bring you into this question as well. How are, you know, how are you thinking about this from the state level? Well, we usually say that grading is the purview of local districts and schools. That's really up to them to decide how they want to do it. I would echo what Jonah said though, that, that I like to think of it rather as how do we provide meaningful feedback to students that helps them to grow? And so, I mean, my own daughters, I have two daughters in public school, one in eighth grade, one in fifth grade. They enjoy getting feedback from their teachers. They, they want it, they strive for it, and they, and they do things with it to revise their work and make it better. But that's the question, right? Is like going back to Jonah's point, like what is the point? And if it's just some set of, protocol mechanisms that allow us to arrive at a grade because that's what we're all trying to do because we've done that for a hundred years, then let's upend that and think instead of the purpose around meaningful feedback for kids that helps them to grow. And I would just echo that by saying, um, we think about that at the state level in terms of teacher evaluation and principal evaluation as well, where we put out a set of focused indicators this year that, um, that we took the evaluation system and we said, which of these indicators are gonna be most important for the work that teachers and principals are doing during a pandemic? And then we provided resources to help support meaningful feedback to teachers and principals through that system. 
And we got a lot of good feedback from districts that they appreciated that. So again, what is the point? Why are we doing this? And if we don't have a good rationale and it's not helpful to kids or to educators, let's change it. I love that. And I love sort of rooting it in both you and Jonah named this in the world of work. Like we operate every day, all of us on feedback, not on a grade, right? We operate on real actionable next steps that we need to take to improve our work. And maybe there's this opportunity to deliver more of that for our students. I'm gonna keep us moving. Um, and I'm gonna start with Lindsay, but I'm gonna, I think everyone can get in on this one. And this has been coming up in the chat in different ways. And there is sort of this question about you know, remediation versus acceleration. And I, you know, we have even parents and educators who are in this chat, I believe, right? Thinking like, well, do we just hold people back, right? Sort of start, do it again, take two. Or what does acceleration look like, right? What does that sort of process look like in schools? I make meaning of that, Lindsay, from your vantage point, and then I'll bring it over to you, Jonah, as well. Like, what do you think should be happening here and how should parents and educators be thinking about this sort of essential question? Yeah, I mean, I think we had a lot of people um, in the fall. So one thing I do wanna point out is, I think many parents, those parents who were able to work at home, even those who were just spending more time, maybe had to leave their jobs. I mean, so many people, they were around their children a lot more. So we had a lot when watching them learn. So we saw a wave of questions from parents, should my, their child wasn't identified with a learning disability, but they were like, should my child be doing this? Should they be, should these things be happening when he's reading? Um, and we have a tool that assesses risk called the LD checklist, and I'll put it in the chat. And it's just about risk. It just kind of helps you make sense of what you're seeing. That was off the charts for us initially. And I think it was for those parents who were concerned and wanted to see, discover what they were seeing. Similarly, we then saw over the winter, a lot of questions, <laughs> excuse me, coming in about remediation. Should I just hold my, my child back? We certainly saw lots of parents not enroll their student in kindergarten. We saw lots of them do that. In special education and disability, I think there's two different components to thinking about holding someone back. The data and evidence we have under normal circumstances do not support doing that. Our, most of our leaders in the field um, under, again, obviously we don't have any data in a pandemic, but we certainly have data that demonstrates that if you don't keep your student with their same age peers, they experience some uh, negative, very negative consequences from that. So I'd be very cautious. Um, and we went to our professional advisory board of which um, Dean Shard is the chair and asked them, lots of them, what are you thinking about this? Because perhaps it's a moment. Um, and by and large, the evidence just doesn't support that. So one caveat I wanna make there, which is in some states, students with very significant disabilities can remain in school longer. So for those students with significant cognitive disabilities, there might be reasons to rethink uh, how they're handling, whether they're graduating, how you're using that sort of the final years of their um, K-12 education. That's the only caveat there. The, the next thing I'd say is acceleration. I think students with disabilities need to be thought of as all students during this time. And that is that what we know is great core instruction help students with learning disabilities more than almost anything else. If you don't have great core instruction, that's the instruction going out there for every kid, mm -hmm. then you're not really gonna have, um, you're, you're still gonna see the persistent inequalities that, we, that I described at the top of this. So I think when we're, we really need to be looking at, I, I noted Milwaukee's plan, there are a few others that are working with big um, groups to try to say, how do we, um, help our teachers with the curriculum and how do we move toward power standards. Jonah mentioned um, competency-based education. We're very positive about that for kids with disabilities and universal design for learning and, and competency-based allows lots of different ways to show what you know. Um, I think we just have to push on our systems to be putting that in place. I will say, I think teachers are exhausted. I've seen that in the comments. I feel that in my day-to-day -day life. And so, 
I'm always a little hesitant pushing too much change. And Heather, I think you're in a really hard position at the state trying to navigate what can people, what can people in the system handle. And so it is a very tough challenge. Uh, I do feel optimistic with what we've learned a lot through this. Um, and I think there's good ways to move forward. Yeah. Yeah. I, can I just add one data point? We know from the National Center for Education Statistics that students who drop out of school are five times more likely to have been retained. Yep. Just sit with that for a minute. Students who drop out of school are five times more likely to have been retained, meaning we held them back from going on to the next grade level. Some states have tried this and the result, like Mississippi has tried this, the result is ridiculous. Yeah. It, what, what happens is that thousands of kids don't meet this standard that they set to go on to the next grade level. And then the districts have to make up loopholes for the kids to be able to advance. Rather than saying to ourselves, how do we actually teach children who are below grade level? Which as I said at the beginning is a problem that we've known how to, how to solve and how to address for a very long time. In the 1990s, I taught a class of 28 students who were in third, fourth, and fifth grade. Nine of them were students with IEPs. And we managed to get them all on grade level by the end of the year. Was it easy? No. But it could be done, and it was done. And I, I submit to you that teachers are doing this all the time. And so let's not take it out on the kids with bad policy. Totally. Gosh, so well said. And also the whole notion that you teach a kid to succeed by failing them. Like who, who came up with that, you know? Um, one concrete thing that just occurred to me with listening to Heather's um, anecdote, so powerful. Um, you know, this is tactical, warning, tactical, but you know, I think it's um, something that I found really useful um, is the, the A2I um, program, which is, um, you know, by Learning Ovations, one of the biggest challenges is differentiation. So if we don't want to sort of paint with a super broad brush and say, you're held back, because I mean, that's terrible for kids developmentally, right? I mean, and let's be real, the, the emotional you know, part of ourselves is probably the, you know, it's the most powerful governing part of ourselves, all of us. So we can't just sort of assume that, you know, the robot child is going to be fine with the extra year because it's what's best for them. But I think, you know, you really need to provide teachers with effective resources so that they can differentiate. And at least with respect to literacy, I don't know that there's anything better. Heather, you're, you're the real expert, but um, I've just been struck by that um, and how the strong the research basis is for A2I and yet um, how little adoption um, there is, relatively speaking. Yeah, I am thinking about our educators in the crowd tonight and they are feeling possibly anxious maybe even some whiplash as we are talking about standards again and even going deeper and to Lindsay's point, sort of pulling out power standards. And so I wanna name that and also name the sort of opportunity for us to do that work. Heather, as you sort of were having that conversation directionally for educators, what's your advice here? You know, we're, they're feeling burnt out We've been having conversations about standards for generations <laughs> um, with, with you know, some success here and there. Sort of where do you, how do you help people find clarity in this moment? So I'd start by saying we don't, we have not identified so-called power standards in Massachusetts. And we have done that for a reason. And the reason is that our frameworks are, we think they're really important. And particularly in ELA, we can't separate out a batch of, of standards and say, teach this only. Um, but what I would offer is a couple of resources. Um, we do have something we call standards navigator. And so I think Lindsay made a really good point earlier that a lot of what we teach is pretty redundant. So, and this is particularly true when there's not a, a set of curriculum that goes over grade levels and is vertically aligned. So I know many families out there have seen like the same book being taught multiple times to their child. And that often happens when a district decides that teachers should be the ones creating curriculum by themselves and there's not a lot of support and there's not coherent vertically aligned curriculum available. So I would offer that as a state agency, we've built a couple of things that might be useful to folks. 
One is what we call family guides. We translated these into 15 languages. And basically it's a one pager that describes for ELA, math and science, what students need to know in each grade level. So it's like almost like the very short version of the longer curriculum frameworks. And so if you're, a, you know, if you have a child like I do in fifth grade, you can look at this one pager for math and you can see what your child is supposed to be learning in fifth grade math. So that's one resource I would, I would submit. The second is something we call standards navigator. And going back to the point of like a lot of redundancy in the, in the curriculum, the standards navigator tool allows you to look at the standards and see the links among them. And so as a teacher, if you're teaching seventh grade, but your students are coming in, you know, one or two grade levels behind, you can look at standards navigator to see what are, what is the content that I need to make sure to teach that they didn't get because they're a couple of grade levels behind. And so it, it does allow you to prioritize um, in ways that are powerful in terms of kids learning the content. So I'll put that into the chat. Thank you. We have, we are running out of time. So I'm gonna do a rapid question. And I'm wondering, and this is for everyone, you know, we know we're aware of the trauma that so many young people have experienced over the course of this last year and their families. Um, we also know that our school discipline system has often disproportionately um, impacted young people of color and students with disabilities. What sort of thinking are you encouraging schools to take on as they will see manifestations of that trauma show up in school? Um, and, you know, we're, we've been here talking about creating a sense of belonging. Jonah, do you want to sort of take a swing? Um, I was actually reading the, the comment um, which I thought was very poignant from Alice Scholl. And I just want to honor her 50 years of uh, service as an educator and um, readily admit that your experiences, uh, my experiences are, are nothing compared to yours and just, just sort of express admiration and respect um, and um, you know, humility um, if, if what has been recommended you know, doesn't seem to, uh, miss, to, to hit the mark. Um, so um, at the risk of uh, further avoiding the, the question, I just wanna say one other thing, which is that, you know, obviously I think there's an acknowledgement that kids needs, um, you know, beyond the cognitive are very, very fundamental. And I don't know, we've not, because of 90 minutes touched on the sort of broader um, array of injustices that um, kids face and that affect how they show up. And so I just do wanna mention that there is an opportunity here uh, federally for, for the first time, um, you know, in U.S. history, an actual safety net beneath our kids, an actual sort of social security system. And so to the extent that folks are not necessarily paying attention to that because of all the other things, um, I would just encourage you to weigh in and do your part to advocate for a permanent child tax credit expansion. Um, I really hope that doesn't come across as a non sequitur. Um, it really is a fundamental opportunity to provide resources for families so that they can um, have more stable housing, um, put food on the table, um, you know, make choices um, that are good for the kids' health and well-being, um, and that's so fundamental. Thank you, Jonah. I want to either from Lindsay or Heather, you know, as we're thinking about the the manifestation of trauma showing up day in and day out, um, and also our shared commitment to to racial equity. And, and equity for students living with disabilities. And we know that those are the kids who are oftentimes the most impacted by our sort of broken punitive discipline systems. What advice do you have for schools as they are gonna be experiencing that wave of trauma um, arriving? I really think, I wanna to defer to what Heather has to say on this, um, but I will just add one because it's a persistent issue. And I'll just add one thing, which is we are seeing from lots of states, not Massachusetts, but um, several states that are reaching out to us and they're concerned about over identification of children. Um, identification 
as having a disability, but you know, this has been a historic problem for us. It's very hard to determine an invisible disability, a learning disability. There isn't a blood test for that disability. There, there's a really great proven practice, but it means observation, progress monitoring, intervention, and working together to determine, make the best determination for the kid. Too often, people misidentify um, disabilities and they do it we know from the data most prominently to, with our black and brown students. And then that leads directly to discipline. So I think it's a, it is a, it, there is a, I just would say, I know Heather will have a lot to say on the discipline elements of it. I just wanna say it really starts with identification and there's pressure now on our systems with kids coming back in. Um, how will we make good decisions about who, who, what need is really emerging? I think that this question of how will we approach students when they come back, um, I think it first begins with ourselves. And so I would say that, um, so I identify as a white woman who's straight, highly educated. And I have found this year that in leading my team at the Center for Instructional Support, that I've needed to start first with myself as a leader and specifically look at my own implicit biases, my own explicit biases sometimes. I've needed to do a lot of reading, reflecting, thinking. I've needed a lot of feedback and I've needed to invite that. So I think this nexus of schools in a pandemic during a time of national racial reckoning needs to begin with ourselves. So I would offer that with a lot of humility. I, I, it's often five steps backwards and half a step forward. So I would offer that for us as educators that we need to begin with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then I think second, there are lots of policies in place and data analyses that we need to continue to do. We have a statute in Massachusetts about student discipline. The districts are required to, to report discipline rates, um, discipline uh, uh, situations to the state and we disaggregate and analyze those. Um, but I would take us back to what TK, our um, Takeru Nagayoshi, reminded us, our 2020 Teacher of the Year, that students have learned a lot this year. And we need to listen to them, and we need to learn from and with them. So it's with optimism that I approach the fall, with also a great sense of pragmatism about the hard work that lies ahead of us in the upcoming weeks before the end of this school year, in setting up summer school programs that don't just repeat what we've always done and that enter us into the fall so that we're prepared to learn together and continue this work. Despite the fact that, as I said at the beginning, we don't exactly know what to do. So for those reasons, I appreciate being amongst you tonight and learning together and trying things together and trying to serve students and families as best we can. And we'll start here in Massachusetts where we have nearly 1 million students by trying to well serve them and trying to upend the pernicious patterns of the past that have not served them, particularly BIPOC students, well at all. Mm. So I look forward to doing that work together. Thank you for that, Heather. And uh, I think an important way for us to end tonight, right? Thinking about our individual work that we have to do. You named that, Heather, so beautifully. Um, leading starts, you know, party of one and the journey that we all go on as educators, as system leaders, as school leaders, um, and with a laser focus on creating opportunity, making school matter, um, and helping young people see what's possible after it's all done. Um, and I, I think also about, you know, so much of what Lindsay said as well, the sort of advocacy uh, self-advocacy that so many students have developed over this year and that work will continue as we think about what's possible. And then Jonah, your continued solutions on how our schools can innovate time and create the sort of systems and structures and routines for adults to know students well and that that can look a hundred different ways. Something as loose as just assigning a kid, uh, an adult to a student and something as sort of concrete as advisory um, as we sort of know it intellectually. Um, there was a lot here and we're also gonna end with so much sort of left to figure out. 
Um, but I really want to thank you, Lindsay, Jonah, and Heather for showing up tonight and, and being allowing for this to feel messy at times too. I want to thank everyone who asked questions. I tried to pull as many of them as I could into sort of coherent ideas, but I recognize that there was so much that we missed tonight and I hope we can continue this conversation. Um, and of course, I wanna thank BU and Dr. Chard for, for hosting us this evening. Um, we feel so thankful to be with you and your team is just amazing. To our sponsor, Eastern Bank, Thank you for investing in this conversation and this opportunity. And to the Barbara Epstein Foundation as well, thank you for continuing to support this work um, and trying to create solutions that are going to advance equity for students everywhere. Thank you.